Uh, we called it Lakeview for some reason. Scott kind of named it that, I guess, and we're sticking with it. So yes, there it is. Uh, those are the people that have effectively contributed to it. I'm Nick Flores. Okay, so we have the data. There's obviously explaining in case somebody doesn't know what, what's going on. There are 15 stations at the lake. Uh, they're used to sample lots of different variables. Borophil, as we're seeing for algal blooms, dissolved oxygen. Temperature is what we were interested in. So we, uh, we took the data for the temperature and we wanted to put it on a 3D cube, obviously. For each station, we wanted to show the temperature and the depth. Uh, and as a result of showing the depth uh, around the lake, we should be able to figure out some kind of volumetric model that shows the temperature. So also we want to see if we can animate this stuff over time, temperature over time. So volumetric model of the lake, um, you know, we, we took what we knew about the stations. Uh, Angela from the Lake Champlain Basin program told us how deep each station generally was sampled to. So we knew roughly uh, if we had a station at this location, we could map it to one of the eight LEDs on this cube, and that would be the, the relative depth. Um, and then we, we were kind of treating the top of the cube as the surface of the lake, the LEDs on the bottom of the cube for the depth of the lake, right? Uh, so if we did that, we should be able to generate a rough volumetric model. We did uh, manually map the various uh, stations to the LED locations or the columns, I guess. So this is like the surface of the lake we're looking at. We figured, well, based on the map, real life, this is sort of what it would look like. I mean, it's hard, if you're squishing stations that are in a long, narrow lake onto a square cube, so it's not obviously perfect, but it's a, it's a fair model. Um, and then we also looked again at the, the depth. So we know the deep, deepest point in the lake was 100 meters, roughly, and shallowest point was, you know, less than a meter, I suppose, but we, we mapped the depths into one of the uh, eight LEDs to try and show it. Uh, then the temperatures, <laughs> we, uh, yeah, after much uh, trial and error, we, we jumped the temperatures. Uh, we took um, 1992, every station in the lake, we took uh, the first set of temperature readings for that station in the lake on, in that year. Uh, and put them all into a CSV file that had basically just the station and the value. And uh, we did it for 1992 and 2014. As was previously said, and what we just heard, there are a lot of holes. 92, not every station was sampled. Um, and uh, I was trying to do it like the first reading of the year, but some places that was in May, sometimes it was in June. So, you know, it's not exactly apples to apples all the way, but it's close enough. And then for places there was no data, I cheated, I fudged it, and I copied the closest parent <coughs> station's values into uh, that location. Um, and we also noticed in making this model look decent, we had a, there's a couple of spots here, like this one, uh, where we, we inserted a fake station that was the average values of the two nearby stations to try and fill out the model. Uh, we only have two of those. There's, yeah, there's, there's that one of the, the 19 and 9 and then like right above. Right above it. And it said 33, 25, and 19 were averaged to get, get values for that. Um, and we'll go into exactly how I average all the values because it's not that interesting, but it's basically average values. So we generate a CSV for each year, 92, 2014. Um, we used processing. We tried using the Spark thing, but since we couldn't show it on a cube because we couldn't load it, we figured for this demo we may as well just do it in processing. Uh, processing L3D's library has, a, or no, just processing in general, has got a, a method that's like load table. It's like table, CSV file, bam, it's in memory, and you just can iterate over it. So that's what we did. No magic, uh, really, for doing the CSV. 
this is what the CSV looks like. That's so I mean for each station there's a lot more stuff. This is all we kept. And you can see like for the beginning, station two, 2014, there was uh, you know three deaths recorded with three temperature results. Uh, the static image that I generated here is okay. But I'm going to just have it switch over here to Scott. Uh, <coughs> so. And. So basically, what you're looking at is uh, the 1992 readings. Basically, ideally, you would have a number of CSVs that would, you know, you'd be able to step through and then show it like over time. Um, fortunately, what we're doing right now is like the warmer sections you can see are red, um, and these sort of faded sections are actually uh, the more milder temperatures. Um, and then you just sort of step through with the key press, and you can see that like that's 2014 and that everything is a little more diluted in terms of uh, heat distribution. So, 1992, 2014, that kind of thing. And so, if we had more CSVs, we'd be able to see more of a change over time as opposed to something as extreme as that. Um, and ideally, we would actually be using like more of a gradient in terms of colors, but right now that's what's going on. Yeah, given the, given the size of the cube, if you do too smooth of a gradient, it's almost, it can be kind of hard to see a little bit. Um, so like in 92, it's interesting like how the data apparently shows that the center of the lake uh, has the coldest temperature, not the bottom here. This is warmer than the center. Um, and the column, the water column in 92 is pretty much cold you know, better way through in that area based on the data in May. 1992 for those stations. So I think we'd see a lot more if we had a lot more CSVs processing the data into the CSVs. Or a lot more cubes. Is, or a lot more cubes, <laughs> right. It's pretty tedious. Um, but anyway, that's where we're at. So I think, you know, in the long term, you could build up a, a bunch of data and either send CSV files, or I know there's lots of ways to do Node.js and streaming and stuff to it if you're using the Spark libraries at least, so that would be cool. 